Have you ever heard the term multiple personalities? This is an old term prior to the DSM-4 if you recall the history of the DSM. Remember the DSM is a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and we use the fifth edition now. You might still hear people using this term. This current diagnosis is actually called Dissociative Identity Disorder. This is just one of the dissociative disorders in the DSM-5, which you will learn more about in this module. Dissociative identity disorder is often confused with schizophrenia, another diagnosis you will learn about in this module. My hope for each of you is at the conclusion of this module, you can clearly indicate the difference between dissociative identity disorder, we refer to it as DID for short, and schizophrenia. I also hope you can carefully explore and learn from your biases. Even as I have mentioned the term multiple personalities, dissociative identity disorder, and schizophrenia, you may have had reactions. None of us are bias-free. It is important for us to become aware of our assumptions, our reactions, and biases so we can change them. If we don't have that awareness, we cannot change them. You can even pause this video right now and jot down any reactions you noticed as I brought up the diagnostic terms, or as I explained them further in just a bit. You will also learn in this module about dissociation as a normal experience, and that in the severest sense of it, that's what results in dissociative identity disorder. Truly, it is a fascinating way the brain works to help those experiencing severe trauma to cope. The DSM-5 details related to dissociative identity disorder have the following criteria. The first one is that two or more distinct identities or personality states are present, each with its own relatively enduring pattern of perceiving, relating to, and thinking about the environment and self. According to the DSM-5, personality states may be seen as an experience of possession. These states involve a marked discontinuity in a sense of self and sense of agency, accompanied by related alterations in affect, behavior, consciousness, memory, perception, cognition, and or sensory motor functioning. These signs and symptoms may be observed by others or reported by the individual. Note the way the identities show up may vary with culture. For example, possessions form presentations may be more typical in some cultures and the individual's circumstances. The second dissociative identity disorder criterion in the DSM-5 is that amnesia must occur. Amnesia is defined as gaps in the recall of everyday events, important personal information, and or traumatic events. It's not just about the traumatic events, but it can be everyday events, such as missing a chunk of time in the day on any day. The third criteria is that the person must be distressed by the disorder or have trouble functioning in one or more major life area because of the disorder. This is an expectation of all serious mental illness diagnoses. We should not diagnose if the person does not have distress because of the symptoms and or trouble functioning because of it. Please also note we must rule out normal cultural or religious practices. One of the typical examples that is brought up would be the idea of children having an imaginary friend. We must also rule out the possibility of symptoms being due to the direct physiological effects of a substance or other medical issue. We could see similar symptoms to dissociative identity disorder with an individual having a blackout during alcohol intoxication. So, for an accurate diagnosis of dissociative identity disorder, we would rule out other medical conditions, alcohol and other substance use that could create the same symptoms, and cultural practices and religious practices that would make the behavior we see considered as normal for the individual. We would then make sure there are at least two distinct identities or personality states. Amnesia that happens as a result of shifting between these personality states or identities, as well as actual distress or trouble functioning. It is important to realize the individual struggling with dissociative identity disorder might not be the one identifying the trouble with functioning. It might be a family member or other individual. 
Can you see how complex it is to really consider if someone has such a diagnosis? This is not a diagnosis given out lightly. Note the DSM also includes other dissociative disorders such as depersonalization derealization disorder, dissociative amnesia, other specified dissociative disorder, and unspecified dissociative disorder. Let's address two of them briefly now. The DSM-5 indicates depersonalization derealization disorder is characterized by the clinically significant persistent or recurrent depersonalization, which means the person has experiences of unreality or detachment from their mind, self, or body, and or the derealization, which means the person experiences unreality or detachment from one's surroundings. It's the idea of it being considered clinically significant that matters, as we all might have experiences like this from time to time. The DSM-5 describes dissociative amnesia as characterized by an inability to recall autobiographical information. This amnesia may be localized, such as to a particular event or period of time, selective, such as a specific aspect of an event, or generalized, perhaps to someone's life history or identity details. This struggle to recall autobiographical information is not the same as what we would see in a normal forgetting or age-related dementia, for example. Shifting gears, let's turn to schizophrenia. I mentioned I want to make sure you understand the difference between dissociative identity disorder and schizophrenia. Schizophrenia fits under what the DSM refers to as psychotic disorders. Schizophrenia is often confused with dissociation because of the psychosis that is typical to schizophrenia. An individual with schizophrenia is seen as losing touch with reality, which can be easily confused with someone perhaps shifting from one identity to another in dissociative identity disorder or dissociative amnesia's loss of autobiographical information, or depersonalization, derealization disorders, detachment from oneself or one's surroundings. Psychotic disorders have a few key features. Delusions, hallucinations, disorganized thinking, as well as unusual movements or behaviors. Schizophrenia specifically also includes what are called negative symptoms, which include diminished emotional expression and avolition. Let's talk through a few of these features. The DSM indicates hallucinations are perception-like experiences that occur without the actual external stimulus. They are vivid and clear with the full force and impact of normal perceptions and not under voluntary control. They may occur in any sensory modality, so think about your five senses here. Auditory hallucinations are the most common in schizophrenia and related disorders. Auditory hallucinations are usually experienced as voices, whether familiar or unfamiliar, that are perceived as distinct from the individual's own thoughts. Having anything that seems like a hallucination when you are falling asleep or waking up does not count because this is considered normal experience. Do also note that hallucinations may be a normal part of a religious experience of some cultural context. The DSM also notes that disorganized thinking is part of the clinical picture with schizophrenia and is typically something we identify based on what the person shares when they're speaking. The DSM indicates that the person may switch from one topic to another, which is called derailment or loose associations. If asked questions, the answers may be only kind of related or completely unrelated, which would be referred to as tangential. Sometimes the speech is so confusing that we call it a word salad because we can't make any sense of it. Keep in mind, we all might have disorganized speech from time to time, so it really has to significantly impair communication and not because you do not speak the same language. Diminished emotional expression is another feature we see in schizophrenia. The DSM indicates this includes reductions in the expression of emotions in the face, eye contact, intonation of speech, and also movements of the hand, head, and face that normally show the emotional expressions to our speaking. 
Avolition is defined by the DSM as a decrease in motivated, self-initiated, purposeful activities. You will cover these and more as you progress through this module. And do note, we still have to rule out that any of these symptoms are related to drugs or alcohol or another medical condition. The symptoms of schizophrenia often surface between the ages of 20 to 25. Our understanding of the disorder at present is that it is a brain disease which is genetic in nature but triggered by situational factors. So nature and nurture are both involved to some extent. Thus, it may not express itself unless certain situations or environments trigger the symptoms. This has been established through studies with identical twins, where one develops the symptoms and the other twin is just under 50% likelihood of developing the symptoms as well. If two individuals who both have schizophrenia have a child, that child would be at the same risk level, under 50%. Even a fraternal twin will only have less than 20% chance, and a sibling less than 10%. Someone with an aunt or uncle who has schizophrenia only has 2% chance of developing the disorder. In the general population, it's 0.5 to 1%. Ultimately, both dissociative identity disorder and schizophrenia are complex disorders and must be assessed very carefully. I do hope as you dive into the materials for this module that you found this quick overview as helpful as you learn to distinguish dissociation and schizophrenia.